Am I audible? Can everyone hear me? Yes. Yay. So, yeah, as I said, my talk is a history of oxygen. Yeah, I'll be touching on alchemy, I'll be touching on thermite, and I will be touching on English nobleman suffocating birds. <laughs> I'm kind of going to spoil the ending for you. I'm going to tell you the start and the end right now. The start is a Greek philosopher who threw himself into a volcano to prove that he was a god. Didn't really work. <laughs> the end is a French nobleman who was executed by guillotine because he watered down the nation's tobacco supplies. But the thing is, between those two, we have the entire history of how we understand fire, how we understand breathing, how we understand fermentation, we're in a bar, so that's pretty appropriate, and how we understand rusting. So the first one is Empedocles, the Greek philosopher. He came up with the theory of the four elements. So you've got your, uh, your earth, your water, your air, and your fire. Everything is made out of four elements. The classic example is wood. You burn wood, you get ash, that's your earth, and you get flames coming out of it, that's your fire. So everything's made out of that. Now he's the one who threw himself into a, into a uh, volcano to prove he was a god, or to make people think he was a god because he was actually a con man. No one's quite sure, but he definitely threw himself into Mount Etna, <laughs> which is, you know, not a great survival strategy. This story is kind of kind of jump around, there's no clear path, because a lot of this is happening simultaneously. But uh, the next person in our story is Galen, the, uh, the doctor. He's one of the first great medical theorists. And he argues that the reason we breathe is to cool down the fire that burns in our hearts. And he didn't mean this in a way of, oh, my love for you burns. No, he literally meant we're on fire inside. That's why we're war. As far as I know, no one ever tried to light a fire from the fire in the heart which is probably for the best for whoever they would have experimented on. <laughs> but this was something that Galen argued for very seriously. And next up, so taking on from Galen, taking on from Empedocles, taking on from Arab scientists, taking on from all sorts of uh, religious mysticism, you have uh, those, those wonderful favorites of conspiracy theorists and people who think they're going to make money out of nothing, alchemists. <laughs> and they were really into calxes, the C-A-L-X. A calx is the, the gritty stuff left over when you burn a metal. They were really into making calxes. Because it proved, uh, it proved that when you heated a metal, it changed. It's really important if you think that you can heat lead and turn it into gold. And obviously, that part never worked. They were able to turn stuff like uh, mercury into mercury calx. But they won't have to do the other way around, so you have to turn mercury yeah. calcs back into mercury by heating it up again. <laughs> but you could go both ways. Yeah. Great example, well, the one they never worked with, is thermite. Thermite, you take a calc, iron oxide, and a metal, aluminum. You mix them together, you react them, and you get aluminum, which is like calx, pure iron, and 2,200 degrees of, sense of, uh, heat, of heat, which will burn straight through tank armor. It will destroy a car engine. It will burn your entire building up. Don't fuck with thermos. Okay. It's not a good idea. So, really at the end of alchemy, you've got uh, Baker. Uh, and he is the first person to really go, or he's the first person to outright say, oh, hold on, if we can burn a calx and make metals, but we can also just leave a metal for a while and it turns into a calyx. And those must be the same process. So the rust that gathers on your bicycle, I mean, you didn't have bicycles, the rust that gathers on your gates, uh, must be made of the same process that I, the met by the calyx that we make when we burn something. So he said, oh, well rusting and burning must be the same thing. And he said, this is because they're releasing a substance called fatty earth or terrapinus. Uh, we're not quite sure Becker's the guy who figured this out, or if he was copying someone else, but he's certainly the first person to write it down. So then you've got Stahl, and he's going, oh, well, I kind of like Becker's ideas, but it's very alchemy. Alchemy's a bit unfashionable at his time. This is late 1600s. So he goes, right, I'm going to throw out all the alchemy, I'm just going to keep the chemistry part. And so he renames it from Terrapingus to phlogiston, which is great, both because it's historically very important, but also because, just say that word, phlogist. Sounds lovely, doesn't it? Um, the problem is, 
trying to explain how phlogiston is going to work ends up saying that phlogiston has negative weight. Which, you know, kind of awkward. No one could really figure out how this was supposed to work. As I said, we're going to be jumping around a bit. So we jump back from Stahl, back to St. Ives Becker, where you have a guy called Boyle, working in County Court in Ireland. And he owns one of the very rare vacuum chambers. There's only about nine or ten of them in the world. One of them is in The Hague, actually, at uh, Christopher, uh, Christian Huygens lab. But one of them's in Cork, and uh, Boyle is going, wait, let's see what happens when I put birds in this and take all the air out. Oh, they die. The thing is, this sounds obvious. Nobody knew that was what was going to happen. Nobody knew that you needed air. They just thought water was toxic. And he did the same thing with candles. He's like, oh, you've got a candle in a glass chamber with a bird. And you just put the bird in without the candle. In the candle, it dies a lot faster. Oh, this must mean that fire is doing something to breath. So he's the first person to go, oh my goodness, air is actually important, not just for cooling you down, the way Galen thought, but if you don't have air, you literally die. He's the first person to figure this out. Now, at the time, he's one of the only people to have a vacuum here. For within about 50 years, this is not so much like a scientific experiment as like a dinner party trick. People in England, rich people, would buy a vacuum chamber kit. And they'd go, come on round. We'll have a roast goose and all the trimmings, and then afterwards, I'll suffocate a dove for us all to walk. <laughs> <laughs> this is so common. There's a guy called Joseph Wright of Derby. He's a kind, he's a technically interesting, but mostly dull painter. And his most famous painting is called An Experiment on a Bird in an Air Pump. And it is, an ex it is a painting of all these people, a whole family, gathered around an air pump while a dove suffocates. <laughs> and so there's the, the father going, look! And the wife going, right, but why should we spend all this money? And the two girls going, oh my god, Brad, what are you the fucking bird? <laughs> but, you know, jump forward again after Stahl, and after a whole bunch of people, I'm just going to leave it out because and we have Lavoisier. And Lavoisier says, okay, phlogiston. So that seems to explain, uh, yeah, it seems to explain fire, and it seems to explain rusting, and it seems to explain uh, breathing, because those seem to be all the same thing. It seems to explain fermentation, which is something Stahl had never done. That's giving that bit. But the problem is, phlogiston makes no fucking sense, because I said negative weight. So what if we just have the reverse of phlogiston. Instead of, so the whole thing about phlogiston is, it's a thing in metal, or in wood, or in anything rustable or fireable that comes out. Just, well, why doesn't it go the other way around? So when you burn something, you add something. When you rust something, you add something. And so he called it oxygen, which he thought was the thing in all acids, which he was actually wrong about. But he was pretty close to being right. He was a hell of a closer than anyone who came before him. And he was like, oh, this is great. And so he's the spawn, he's the beginner of modern chemistry. I mean, some people will question this. Wikipedia even questions this. <laughs> Wikipedia is really conservative when it comes to scientific history. But he starts to think. And then he, he was a, uh, he got his money from being a tax collector in pre-revolutionary France. And then the re revolution happened. And when revolutions happen, and you were a tax collector for the previous regime, you don't have a long lifespan. <laughs> and strictly what he was convicted of was, I had to read this out, having plundered the people and the treasury of France, having adulterated the nation's tobacco with water, and having <laughs> supplied the enemies of France with, a, with huge sums of money from the, from the national treasury. Which is kind of a shitty thing. Thankfully, he was pardoned a year and a half after he was executed. <laughs> but, you know, it's better than nothing. And yeah, so that's the history of oxygen. It goes from a guy jumping into a volcano to a guy being executed for watering down tobacco, which I didn't even know you could do. <laughs> Thank you very much. No one's quite sure, because of course we're only dealing with, uh, there, there are no contemporary texts. Uh, he's a pre-Socratic, so we have basically some poems about him, maybe a couple poems by him. These are only fragments, like maybe a 
hundred lines at most. And these are multi-thousand line epic poems about the nature of the universe, which was the normal way of doing academic writing at the time. Um, thank God it's not now. Uh, but what we know, <laughs> the, like the closest we had to it is someone said that he was trying to prove he was a god by disappearing in the volcano. And maybe then coming out again later, but he jumped in and, his, and the volcano spat his brass sandal back out. That's the most detailed story we have. It's probably bullshit. Like most of the stories about the creature. Like the same thing, like there's one guy who sort of died from laughter watching his donkey getting drunk on rotten grapes. So, I mean, dying in a volcano is pretty normal by the standards of increasing gravity. 